what we're going to talk about today is called LinkedIn Tower. This is actually 222 Second Street. It's only a couple of blocks from here. It's at Second and Howard, and I think some of you may have gone on a site walk that we organized. Uh, we're going to talk about this project in the context of iterative design. We're thinking about what makes this project unique. This is a project that we're doing in collaboration with Tom Pfeiffer and Partners out of New York, and the client is Tishman Spire. It's a speculative office building development, so that means that Tishman Spire was originally building this. They didn't know who the tenant would be. Ultimately, they leased all 450,000 square feet to LinkedIn. They took the whole building. And with that kind of a lease, you get the right to name the building. So LinkedIn is calling this, their working name is LinkedIn Tower that might change to LinkedIn Center. So that's the project. And what we'd like to talk to you about today is the nature of the design and the construction of this particular tower. You can see it, it's right here. It's almost finished construction. I'd like you to take away that design is not a linear path. It doesn't just start here and end over here. It's not a linear path. And I think you probably already know that. But what I think is really interesting about this is that this project is a great illustration of the process of refinement in design and that we keep circling back to something. I would describe it as a spiral. When you come back, you touch on the same subject, but you're making progress and you're improving it and you're getting a more and more refined design solution. And we're going to show you how we did that in the process, not only in design, but also in construction. How you craft the building, how you put materials together, how you do mock-ups and all of that. And we're going to talk about three main parts of the project to illustrate that process of refinement and you know, uh, continuous sort of revisiting that iterative design. Uh, the three parts of the project are the core, which is the sort of center of the building. It holds the structure and the elevators and the mechanical systems, all the stuff that makes the building work. Uh, the second is the building envelope, the curtain wall or the building skin. And it sounds like there's a class that's just doing that. So you'll be particularly interested in that part of this. And then the third piece is the lobby and the ground floor of the building, the public space of the building. So we're going to go through those three elements here and just explain how we iterated on each one of them and what we did to refine the design. So the project, as I said, it's located, it's a great location because it's one block away from the new Transbay Terminal. You know, with the South of Market plan, we have a lot of new office space coming into this transit hub area. We also have a lot of new residential development. It's walking distance to finance. It's close to the Arts District. It's really centrally located in Soma, which is ground zero in a way for the, the sort of revolution that's going on in San Francisco right now. So this project is right in the middle of it, and it's one of the early projects to be realized. So there's a view on Howard Street going west. You know, if you're biking on Howard Street, this would be the view from your bike uh, looking up. And what you see in the massing here is that there's a high-rise component to the project, and there's a low-rise component. So this is a total 26-story tower. Um, it's about uh, 370 feet to the top. And the top 10 floors are the high-rise component. There are 17 floors below that as the low-rise. This setback, we put a roof terrace here, we'll show you. And then at the fifth floor, we create this sort of very subtle expression of you know, marking the height of the buildings adjacent to it. And we just very subtly differentiate that with the curtain wall. And we'll show you how we do that. We call that the cinch. So, so you'll yeah. see it when we get to it. Everything in the... And the, so, yeah, yes. the massing is, uh, you know, it's essentially after a certain height, you, you're limited to a, you know, height and bulk ratio. So I, I've, after you hit that, you have to set back. So the volume and right. massing of the building is completely dictated by the planning code. So we work within those parameters to, to make this thing work. Okay, so. Starting with the core, the first thing that we want to talk to you about. Yeah, so now we'll get into kind of, you know, I liken a core to like a, your spine. It's supporting, it's kind of what supports the building. Um, it's the major functions that track all the way up through the building. You know, elevators track all the way up, mechanical, um, bathrooms, that sort of thing. So when you're planning, uh, spec office building, you have to take that into consideration and think about where you're trying to place the core. 
Um, so, you know, one thing, if we take a step back, right now we're looking at the high, this is the high rise massing that you guys saw. This is the low rise and then just versions of the ground floor and the basement. And so one thing when you're working with a developer is they have um, certain criteria they want to meet. They want to have certain lease steps for a potential tenant, like a tech tenant might want to be in a really deep space. Um, and then let's say a professional services tenant who might go in a high rise um, would want to have a shorter lease span that is kind of more evened out. So, um, you know, as you can see, we went through, this is just a sampling of options. We probably went through 25, 30 options, of course, but this is 12 options one week, just, you know, all hands on deck and, you know, in our, stu in our project team. So, you know, you're, you're working very fast to come up with these solutions, but you're also tracking things from basement all the way up to the um, high rise. So this is the selected version. Um, so this is a low rise planning. So you can see there's, there's balanced lease spans. We have deeper lease spans on two sides to market towards a tech tenant. And then if you go up one more, oh, there you go. In the high rise, um, if you see, if you, if you go back, can you go back? Sorry. So that you'll see the elevators, and then when you tr go up to the high rise, you'll see the elevator stack, and all the elements such as stairs and you know restrooms and that thing are sort of the fungible elements that you can transfer and swing. So we've got um, three floors of transfer space. So it occurs under the terrace on 16. The entire core swings, and that's pretty unique. Usually you see a core just go all the way up. You do a center core, you do a side core, but. Um, you know, we wanted it to look at something flexible for the client, so that's what we ended up with. And then this is uh, the low rise, just showing uh, typical. So once you kind of identify what your core is, you oftentimes do um, fit out. So this is just a rendering showing what a tech tenant might look like if they occupy the space. So this is completely open office, almost completely open. There are a few conference rooms on the sides, but it's a very densely packed office floor plate with open office plan, right? Seas of desks, yep. And then this is a typical high rise, so a professional services firm might want to have perimeter offices. So, you know, you would look at a plan where you've got your main kind of conference room coming off the office lobby, and then um, just perimeter offices around the space. And then you're also looking down at the 17th floor terrace. And then these are some of the renderings that we generated. So what's interesting is when you're drawing the core, you're drawing the part of the building that nobody actually occupies. It's a very technical exercise. You're trying to get everything to work. It's the structure, the elevators, all these things that are very non-negotiable. They don't like to bend or move, but it's actually not the part of the building anybody occupies. What you, with the, the negative space, the leftover space, is what people actually use. So these renderings show a sense of what it's like to be in that office or maybe floating just outside that office, uh, what it's like to use that space. This is the view from the 17th floor terrace looking east over. You can see the Infinity Project, another Tishman Spire project, the Bay Bridge, obviously. And uh, this is a high-rise floor. Lindsay, this is, which yep. floor is this? Um, it's probably 20, I would say. Right. So the building's got um, really unobstructed views right now because there's not a lot of um, high rises around it. So it's pretty incredible. This gives you a sense of how that, you know, private office type of layout would work a little bit more, right? You can see the idea of a gathering space, sort of casual gathering in the corner and then other conference rooms and private offices around it. This would be maybe just off the elevator lobby when you arrive into a high-rise floor plate. And then that's just a you know photo under construction of one of the upper floors. So you kind of get a sense of what you saw in the rendering, the overlapping of the shingle. You can, kind of, you can see that in the background. Um, the floor to ceiling glass, the glass is planned for nine foot ceiling heights. Some other great uh, construction progress views, the fisheye camera here uh, with the, this is before there's any concrete poured on the deck and I think this was before any of you uh, got the tour of this space because you can't really walk up there. Uh, but it does give you a sense that this is a pretty nice uh, wide open floor plate. 
Um, those are just views of the core construction. So the core is a brace frame construction. Oftentimes you'll see either brace frame or um, a concrete core. So the advantage of brace frame is erection time. It goes up very quickly. Um, and the, a lot of the steel, there's a lot of kind of international story behind the project. The steel comes from, well, Luxembourg or Thailand. Um, so, and then it, it's fabricated in Thailand and then gets shipped here, fabricate, you know, erected on site. So what you're looking at in this very top right photograph is a robotic welding equipment that's assembling the steel plate. So the steel plate comes from Korea or Japan, goes to Thailand and they robotic weld everything together and then ship it to the site. Some of it is sourced domestically as well. But what it shows you is the idea of you know, how that, all that brace frame construction around the core is working here. So this is all seismic bracing, right, here in California yeah. with earthquakes. Uh, that's the sort of really key design aspect of this core. And then you see some additional photos of, you know, fireproofing going onto the steel, the stair, the egress stair going in, all of that being interlaced into this. So it's a very, the core planning is this very technical exercise. I think the concept of the iterative design, it really takes place in those multiple options that we study early. You sketch all that out and you lock it in and then as you can see, these are not things that you're going to mock up or change in the field. You just build, once you've got it completely understood and known, then you build what you've drawn. I just threw in steel. Just Two more shots, yeah, yeah construction. Steel going up. So you'll see what, for construction, it's really about sequencing. So you'll see, you know, the steel go up and then the floor decks start to go down and then fireproofing after that. And then the um, steel has to be a certain level above concrete before they pour the concrete slabs. And then concrete has to be a few levels above curtain wall, eight floors above curtain wall before they'll start that. So it's almost like a dance, you know, for um, the contractor. They're always trying to maintain that sequence of operations. Okay, so that's the core. That's the first thing that we wanted to talk about. The second thing is the building facade, the skin, the, uh, the enclosure, the building envelope. So going back to this view, uh, looking a little bit more zoomed in here, you can see uh, really this project is about a very simple move on the facade. It's one very simple move, which is this shingled facade concept. You see it here at a detail scale. So there's an aluminum mullion, and that aluminum mullion accommodates the shingling of the glass, right? And so what you have here is about a one-foot cantilever of this glass past the aluminum, and then about a four-inch gap here and the angle of the rotation is about four degrees on the glass, right? And so this is a very, very simple, although it doesn't look that simple, it's a very simple expression of the materials and the facade, and it's just all about the glass. There are no other sort of formal moves to the building. It's just this very, it's like, I always say, it's like choosing a really nice fabric and making something very, very simple out of that fabric. Uh, that's what this project is all about. So we can see kind of how that renders at a larger scale. So these are early design renderings, just sketching out the idea. And we'll show you uh, the number of iterations and mock-ups and everything that we did on the facade. So this is just a sampling of the mock-ups that uh, were conducted for the facade. Um, you know, the, your first kind of initial, when we're thinking about the building and the exterior, and it's really all about the glass. So the initial, um, mock-ups were kind of just in in our office we ordered I don't know probably 75 different samples of glass and you lay them out on a table you take them outside and you really look at does it does the building want to be reflective does it want to have a certain color to it you know you know you're kind of going through that um, look and feel process and then once you get beyond that um, you know you go through a series of kind of visual mock-ups and then eventually performance mock-ups to really just it's a continuous refinement of the details. So this is after the sample selection. This is um, the f initial glass mock-up. So, you know, you can see just really simple diagram drawing on the left of there's five different glass types. Um, and we wanted to start with a ref the reflective glass types are on the left. And then we thought, well, what if the building you know, has a tinted glass, but it wants to be very neutral and very calm. So we looked at um, gray glass. So you'll see the three gray types, um, middle to right. And then it's just kind of playing with 
reflectivity, visual light transmittance, which is how much light comes into the space. So when you're standing on the inside, how much light you're seeing come in. And then, um, you know, there's performance values as well. So this is this mock-up is not full scale. The glass, the current wall units are, the glass is six feet by 13 feet. I think these are about seven feet tall and four feet wide, but it gives you, and it starts to give you an idea of what the sense of the space. So we narrowed it down to a gray neutral glass. Which is the one shown in the middle here. So this was to get which is the right family of glass, not the exact glass product, right? The one in the middle, both in the mock-up and on the horizontal line, so it has a very low exterior reflectivity. You see this 7% uh, right here, and it's all about getting those right characteristics and properties. One of the things that's interesting that we learned from this mock-up is that when you stood inside, and no one would have predicted this, is that the interior reflectivity of the glass, there was a sort of purple haze that was created, not in a good way, in a bad way, um, from the fluorescent lights and things like that. And so realized that would be very disturbing if you saw that. It's one of those things about choosing the material. You always have to be very careful, and there are unexpected things that you have to study. And there's just no replacement for a full-size piece of the material that you're thinking of using. So after narrowing down um, to that gray, kind of very neutral glass with low reflectivity, um, this is for the actual glass selection. So this gl glass is a full size. These are six feet by 13 feet. You can actually see that initial selection here um, that we put next to it. So what we did is we selected, I don't know, 15 types of glass. And um, you know the curtain wall subcontractor will do the drawing. And we actually, before the um, primary viewing, we had them rearrange the glass. So we took pieces out, we inserted pieces back in. We we put them from you know darkest to lightest, um, just and we actually, on the day of the viewing, were able to rotate the um, flatbed, so you could look at it at different orientations to see how the glass is going to look facing south, north, etc., etc. Et um, and then you can see the interior views. Like Ben was saying, it's really important to look at the glass from the interior as well because that's where you'll be spending most of your time. <laughs> And then um, the selected glass is uh, it's inner pane. They're from Germany, and it's a very just very neutral gray. You guys have seen it. It looks very dark from the outside, but from the inside, it has a really nice. Um, it's very neutral. It has actually a really nice feel inside as well. So if if you if you've ever been to the uh, there's a taco truck and a little coffee stand at the corner of Spear and Folsom, that's where this mock-up is, and that's actually a flatbed tractor trailer right there. And uh, we all came out here and we were looking at it. And then we went to lunch at Prospect across the street and we asked them to reorient th this thing. And I mean, it's not really street legal, this, this tractor trailer, the way it's configured it's here. Glass on it. This has got this glass <laughs> stacked up on top. They built it in the parking lot and then they had to take it down. But we asked them to reorient it. So this tractor trailer is trying to move this thing around and there's power lines and trees and the thing is ready to tip over. And we're all sitting in Prospect having lunch watching this happen. And all these, you know, hipsters are lined up in front of the taco truck, and this big tractor trailer is backing around, noticing. and they all think it's really cool. And yeah, I'm thinking, half of them. you better move out of the way because <laughs> that thing might fall over. So that was mock-up number two. <laughs> so after that mock-up, um, this is just a, you know very early concept um, drawing of the shing of the shingle and the overlap. So. You know, you really, on projects, this project's really about refinement and like looking at things at even a sixteenth of an inch. So we were at the mock-up and they had supported the glass with this just small channel. It was just, just for supporting it. You can, you can see that frame there. And we kind of liked it. It helped emphasize the shingle. It helped it kind of not go as flat when you were further away. So, you know, just even something as simple as that you can take away from a mock-up. So we added um, that one inch cap after the mock-up. I remember when I was a junior in college and my TA told me uh, some of the best moments in architecture happen when you glue something upside down on the model by accident and you realize it actually is better that way. This is one of those, yeah. right? The contractor said, do you mind if we put this frame on the glass just to help hold it in place on the mock-up, just for the mock-up, since you're just choosing the glass anyway? So we said, sure, no problem. And they put it on there, and we saw the mock-up, and we said, that actually looks pretty good. Because you can see the shingle better than if you don't have it. 
And as Lindsay's pointing out, it's that subtle one inch. I don't even know if you guys can see it from the back. It's yeah, a subtle can. one inch on the on the glass Small there. That's the difference, right? So that was the next lesson learned on that mock-up, as well as choosing the glass. And so just a comparison shot showing without and the addition of the frame. It's very subtle, but you, you, you notice it when you're kind of interacting with the building. Um, so the third mock-up is, you know, the glass has been selected, the basic system has been designed, so it's the performance mock-up. Um, and you're essentially looking at your different wall types, and then you, they actually test those wall types to see how they perform with air infiltration, water infiltration, they do st uh, static and dynamic air and water, and then they actually rack the, um, the mock-up to test it seismically as well. So it's kind of the first time that you get to see your wall type actually you know, constructed. Um, so you'll see this is just the typical shingles, and the, the shingles we didn't, I don't think we talked about it, but they actually switch directions as you, the massing changes up the building. And then the, um, that cinch, that fifth floor, um, is at the top. They're not actually in order. It just worked out that way for the mock-up. And then you can see just kind of the piles of extrusions for the project. And then um, a map of, you'll see this at, in the factory. There's maps for each project of the extrusion types to help, the, to help assembly. So you start to see the profiles. And you can see that, that um, cap expression. And then you're also looking at the mock-up for um, quality and craft. So this is an example of, this is at the cinch condition, zoomed in. You know, it's pretty, it was pretty messy. A lot of the mock-up that was out there um, was a little alarming because a lot of the conditions, you know, weren't fully baked. Um, so you're really there to kind of look at all those details and you know, really zoom in and see how you can, if you can modify any of that um, to help the project overall. And then one example on the cinch, we, we got, the city got very involved with this project and they wanted us, the cinch went through many iterations. At one time it was set back and the columns were exposed. Um, so we were actually, the city was arguing with us over the depth of a, of a fin, which is a very architectural decision. So, you know, the fact that it's really interesting that the planning department really gets involved in these sort of decisions. So at the mock-up, we were actually taping off the fin um, to see how, you know, if we made it shorter, what it looked like. So um, from that mock-up, we decide on the depth of the fin. So just comparison shots. And then just Giving just an overall of the facade, um, you can see this, like we said, the shingles switch directions as the massing changes. And then on the ground floor, the glass is the same um, curtain wall expression. It's just pulled all the way down to the ground. And the glass switches out to low iron, so it's very clear. And then we've got these large um, sliding doors um, for the public space. They're, I mean, they're massive doors. The doors are 20 feet by 20 feet, and they're on you can only, well, they're motorized because there's no way anyone can push that size of a door open. Yeah, this shows you the second street view. So you see there's quite a bit of slope on the site here on second street. It's going up. And so this is looking into the office lobby here. So showing you the sort of pattern of the shingles, the cinch on the fifth floor where that glass fin occurs, that differentiation that occurs there in the, in the just, you see how all these mock-ups are necessary to get that reading just right. This is an early uh, rendering. Uh, the building, I would say, looks like the renderings. This shows you the idea of the shingle in construction and the initial rendering juxtaposed together. So this is looking up by the, uh, by the crane, looking up. First few units going in on the project. So right they there. actually in install them. They bring them out and they swing them around 180 degrees. They have to rotate them. It's pretty scary to watch. We just have a few construction photos uh, of the project, so you can walk over there and look at it. So for you guys, this is not totally necessary, but it's easier for you to see. Uh, but you see how that shingle pattern creates a really subtle uh, effect to the facade? You wouldn't expect that uh, in the overall view. 
when you just look at that detail, but it makes a sense of the building as very dynamic, almost a little bit warped in, in the surface. You see the shingles there on the fifth floor, and then the step back where the, sh uh, I'm sorry, the fins on the fifth floor, and then where the shingles change direction at the step back on the 17th floor here. Okay, so that's the facade. And then uh, the next one is the lobby. So this says we had seven months to do 95 studies, but that's not totally true. Uh, because we were really focused on the core for a lot of that, and you kind of lock in the core and the, the hard elements of the core where they're at, and you don't change that later. So then the next thing that we do is it's really about the planning of the public space, the lobby, and the other spaces on the ground floor. So really we did 95 studies more like in the last three, four weeks of that seven-month frame. Yeah, I don't know how much you guys draw things, but <laughs> there were times when <laughs> you get a little tired of drawing. <laughs> Do it over, do it over. <laughs> yeah. But that's the point here is, right, the refinement comes by reiterating and reiterating, but by making progress as you reiterate. You're not just do it, redoing it for the sake of redoing it, but you're redoing it to make it better and explore a subtly different version of the same thing. And that's where we learned in this project. So um, on this project, we have uh, 88,610 8, square feet of publicly accessible public open space that's privately owned. And you see some of that in some of these buildings south of the market and elsewhere in the city. Um, so that's what we have and it's on, on these plans it's facing to the top. It's a little bit of gray there and it's basically facing towards Howard Street. The office lobby is accessed off of second. And so that's what all these studies are about. How do we configure, we have to meet exactly 8,610 square feet of space here. How do we make everything else come together, the topography of the site and the core being locked in, service access, parking garage access. There are a lot of parts and pieces to make it all work. That's the challenge and that's why we go through so many design iterations. So the selected version looked like this, uh, where essentially as I said, there's the public space there off of Howard Street on the north, and there are these very large openings. You see them here in plan and here. And uh, as Lindsay said, these are about 20 feet wide doors that open, and then you have the office lobby here. And some small retail here, loading and parking access here off the back. Um, this is a small food service venue, so this is intended to be a place where different vendors can come in and try out a concept, so there could be like a blue bottle coffee, not exactly a blue bottle coffee here, that would be there for a while and then they would move on and it could be kind of an incubator space for that kind of pop-up uh, type of retail. It's the idea of a food truck but inside the building. Um, so that's, that's what's happening here and there's a separation here between the public space and the office lobby. We'll show you some renderings of what this looks like. This is the selected version. So you see the, as I said, Second Street is sloping up, and so there's about almost three feet of gain here. So there's actually steps up to get to the office lobby here, and then getting all that to work was the challenge. You see those steps right here in the rendering. So the, you know, the lobby when you're at the public space in the office lobby, um, when you think about materiality, it's a very, it's a very simple space. We have essentially two materials. Um, the walls and ceiling we thought of as um, taking a wood floor and wrapping that on the walls and ceiling. So it's um, teak that is grown in Costa Rica. And then um, actually the teak gets, it's grown in Costa Rica and then it gets fabricated. All the millwork gets done in China. So it goes from Costa Rica to China and back here. So the, it's showing up on site um, next week. So, and then just, um, just basic concepts of seating, you know, kind of to match the walls and ceiling, and then the seating's meant to be moved around if there's events or whatnot. And then the flooring, um, just, you know, you look at it, simple white flooring, but we went through months of deciding if it was stone, if it was terrazzo, if it was concrete, you know, same thing, you're going through these iterations again on the materiality. Um, and then you can see the cafe and um, the artists, so the part of the popos is a 1% of the project budget goes po towards popo is not the platter of food in Hawaii. No. That's different. <laughs> That's called a poo poo, right? Yes. This is popo is publicly open. I love this. I can't ever remember. Privately operated. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so <laughs> that's the popo. That's the popo. Sorry. <laughs> so the artist selected is Frank Stella. You guys may have heard of him. He's pretty well known. Um, and I got to go. It was really cool. I got to go out to his studio. Um, we were mocking up the lighting for how to light, you know, his artwork and the studio in kind of upstate New York just amazing sculpture and pieces. And he's just hanging out, sitting there, looking through a color book, selecting colors for his next piece. And you know, we asked him, we're like, hey Frank, what do you think? Like, what do you think about the lighting? And he looked at us and he just like laughed, waved his hand and was like, I don't want anything to do with that and walked away. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna go next. And then that's just a view in. Um, back towards, looking back towards the cafe through one of the sliding doors. So the idea of these doors is that they open up and the, the public space is truly public and open. That It's just you walk in right off the street and you can go in there. So the idea is the open space, the reason why this is part of the city's requirement is that the building fills up the whole site. We don't have any place to put open space that's uh, outside on the site. So we put it inside the building, but we make it open and accessible to the public. That's why that's there. So we try to make it as accessible as possible by having this door that's so large and it just slides to the side and it's really, truly open. I think there was actually an article uh, recently in the paper about, uh, by John King about how there are a lot of these spaces provided and they're always not accessible or sometimes they're even hidden and they don't even have a sign to tell you that it's there. So our idea here is to be very transparent and open and actually make this work. And then that's a view looking into the office lobby. It's just similar concept. We wrapped we wrapped the floor through to connect the two spaces, and the walls wrap around as well. And then there's a um, glass glass partition that you can that connects the two spaces. So the office lobby has one other differentiation, which is that you can see this white glowing ceiling inside, and so it's a stretch luminous ceiling. It's a fabric, and above it are the lights, and so all you see is just the luminous. Uh, plane in the ceiling. Um, that's the concept there. So it's all about refining and keeping this very, very simple. And if you walk through any building, lobby, or public space, you'll find that there are a lot of sprinklers and strobes and fire alarms and all kinds of other things that you have to put. So the secret is how do you get all those things integrated in a way that no one can see them unless they need to for life safety and make the design look really, really clean and simple. It's really hard to get it to be that clean and simple. It's very easy to add reveals and add places where you tuck all that stuff away. It's really hard to just distill and distill until there's almost nothing left. It's very, very simple. Yeah, I think that's like one thing throughout my career that I've realized. The, the longer you work, you realize how much harder it is to make something simple than it is to add, add on to it. The subtractive process is much more difficult than the additive process. So, we, same thing, went through 10 mock-ups, five flooring mock-ups, or four flooring mock-ups, and um, a number of wall mock-ups as well to kind of decide what kind of material, how does the joinery work, how does it transition, um, all so that. It's all about getting it right, so it's just studying these. And so we'll go through, this is the sampling, and over the course of this nine months, we've gone through these 10 mock-ups, and we're not quite done, even though the lobby is being built out right now. We're still going back and studying, you know, which sealer do you put on the terrazzo and testing different versions of that. So there are all these things that keep going. We'll go through this. So here's number one. So this is the first mock-up that was done with that very initial glass mock-up. Um, you know, way back then we had thought about a white floor. Um, so not that you can tell that any of them look different from the other. <laughs> But they are, one's concrete, one is terrazzo, and one is epoxy terrazzo. It's a thinner terrazzo. Um, and then, so the owner of Tishman Spire came out to look at it, because he gets very involved. And they asked him, they said, Jerry, which one do you like? And he said, well, you guys choose, but whichever one looks the whitest. And I think he pointed to the whitest one. So we went with the architectural concrete to start. It's a marketing center. Yeah, so this is the first mock-up. Uh, well, it's, so they were building a marketing center before LinkedIn said, we'll lease the whole building, right? You need a marketing center to show prospective tenants. 
Um, so this was a great place to do the initial round of mock-ups because you could actually build out, here's what your lobby will look like. So we poured this concrete floor in the marketing center and it gives you a place where you can sort of see um, all the details of handrails and the joints in the concrete, all these things. Um, the, the pin is on that drawing on the top right just to show you a scale of here are the joints in this concrete material, here's how these look, here's how we're going to make them. If you saw cut versus pour it to them, there are all these subtle differences that you get, right? Uh, so if you believe that God is in the details, this is the project for you because this, that has been the mantra on this project. Is if you're talking about how do we make an eighth inch joint in a concrete floor, you know, whether the difference of saw cutting and pouring that joint, right, then you're really down into like the final, final details. Right? This is a set of mock-ups. So there are concrete furniture, there's the lobby, the, the office desk, and some benches. So uh, this is a set of mock-ups that we did down in uh, Southern California. Uh, this is done by Sean Sons, is a great, uh, probably one of the preeminent concrete, uh, you know, contractors around for architectural finished concrete. Uh, and the idea here is we told them, build us a furniture mock-up and make the very best furniture mock-up that you can make. Uh, we showed up here and we looked at this and uh, we realized that there were some issues with it, which don't really show up in these photographs, but uh, it, we realized that making this uh, concrete furniture was going to be very, very challenging, even for one of the best contractors around. So we went away from that uh, based on what we saw in this mock-up. It was really subtle things about some sort of cupping at the top of the furniture. So then we went to Terrazzo, and Lindsay knows, Lindsay did the Terrazzo. We were handing those back and forth to each other. <laughs> so actually the Terrazzo is done um, locally in San Francisco. Well, I don't know, what neighborhood is that? In a garage in the inner Richmond, if you believe that. I mean, you that. basically <laughs> walk through someone's house to go back to their, um, their factory. This is a great terrazzo contractor. They do all the terrazzo out at SFO, but they're set up. They don't need a big shop, so they just have a garage in the inner Richmond, and yeah. that's where they do this. So, so these mock-ups are there. <laughs> yeah, so essentially, I mean, same thing. You're mocking up um, part of the, that public space, that long, um, we've got ben the long benches and stairs. And then just looking at the joinery and looking at, you know, the, the, the desk, the inside and outside corners, looking at, you know, your contrasting stripe on a stair, how that sits into the terrazzo. So just very, very detailed time and time again. The other material uh, in the lobby, the only other material in the lobby is the wood, right? So we did a whole series of mock-ups just to choose the wood What's the graining of the wood? So it's a natural product. So you, know, you have to choose like how light, how dark, how many knots, how many kind of mineral streaks, sapwood, all these kinds of criteria. What kind of figuring do you want? So we went through an initial selection and culling of the wood in Paso Robles at the shop. Then they built these mock-ups in Colorado Springs. Uh, we looked through this and we chose, you know, one has the blue tape shows you there were there are too many knots, too many inclusions. You're really trying to get a feel for what this product would look like applied over a much larger scale. As you saw in the renderings, this is a 10 foot tall mock-up and you're trying to think, what is this going to look like when I put it over this huge space, right? So that's what this is for. Um, and between these two, we narrowed the range down a bit. From there, um, we went to uh, the next slide. So let go ahead and talk about the sure. wood ceiling. First. So Based upon the previous when we selected the, you know, what we were willing to accept with the wood, um, we did the wood ceiling mock-up. So just you guys saw in the rendering, the typical, we've got this linear light slot. And then really, like we said, everything else that's kind of code required, sprinklers, um, speakers, um, you know, that anything that gets inserted, we wanted just to go away so that it really just is these kind of two very pure materials. Um, so. You know, you can, I don't even know if you guys can tell, but we had linear speakers at one time, so we did a perforated um, CNC cut speaker, and it, you know, it almost goes away. Out and of then the wood, right? Out of the wood, yep. So the, the teat gets CNC milled. Um, it was pretty clean. And then, you know, we had access panels. We were able to move them, so that was showing what that joint would look like. And then this is the luminous ceiling mocked up. And as you can see, there's... Um, a little bit of black spots telegraphing through. Um, so we were able to, 
you know, the fabric looks good, but we, the, it's a series of LED panels. The lights are LED panels that are custom size for the space. And um, we were able to identify some issues with that. So that's why the importance of mock-ups, I mean, you can't, you know, you see it. Seeing is believing, so. I think the uh, speaker, so this is the speaker right here. I hope you can appreciate, I mean, that's a piece of wood, right, that's got all the holes, as Lindsay mentioned. And we tried several different ideas about how to make that. And so I think this is one of the great, like, detailed example of the larger point we're trying to make, which is, it's not that just as the architect you say, here's my vision and go build it. There are all these other requirements, right? The speaker manufacturer has to sign on for how that detail works. Can you access the speaker after the fact? What does it look like to us, to the owner? It's getting all these different parties together to agree on what we're doing for the overall project. And to do that and maintain the sort of rigor and the overall aesthetic, that's the challenge, is getting those all reconciled together. And that's what the mock-up process helps you accomplish. So as I was saying on the last one, so we had the wood mock-ups, and then from there we went to the factory outside of Hong Kong, um, which was an interesting experience just because you went through several layers of customs just to get across, you know, to see this wood and then go back. Um, so you see here on the floor, these are dry lays. So these are about 20 feet by 20 feet square dry lays. And so by dry lay, I mean the boards are not glued to each other. They're just all loosely fitted together so that as the architect, you can actually pull some out and remix them. And you can say, this one's too light, this one's too green. And we narrowed that range down. They also did mock-ups of the corners because the corners are prefabricated. So you see that here on the far right. Uh, that's that whole process of selecting the wood. And then same thing. Um, with the elevator cab, so I actually built an elevator cab and um, mocked it up. And so this panel here that the, the gentleman's holding up, we actually ended up that entire panel swings because you have to access the, the top part of the cab in emergencies. So, I mean, it's seamless. You're in there, you don't even know there's an access panel. The access panel is like one wood board back. So, you know, just looking at that. Um, and then it's you know, really important too, because what we found out is the walls are actually warping a bit. So, um, you know, we had to, it's kind of, there's remediation measures that have to be done to get the walls as flat as possible. And then just progress shots, there's the office lobby. You can kind of see that, um, the white zones where that luminous ceiling's going. And then all the plywood's going up right now. The wood should start maybe in two weeks. And then, um, this the looking down the public space, so the cafe is here, and then you can see that plywood blocking is for that one of the art pieces. That's it. That's so it. that's our Thanks ending for. slide. So we're ready for any questions or Thanks anything. For hanging with us. <laughs> yeah, I think we wanted to give you a little bit different. Uh, you know, not just showing you the glamorous renderings, but actually show you a little behind the scenes tour of how we make the magic happen on a project. So. That's what this has been about, and we call that the iterative design process to get to that level of refinement. So I think we have, do we have some time for questions? I don't have a yeah, we go, have sense of time. time. Yeah, so we have time for some questions, if anybody has any. Yeah, so question is about the design process, sort of how do you set things out and make the decisions early on in the design process, right? And Tie together. Yeah, and how many architects are working at the beginning? Sure. Too many. A lot, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the team was 10, 12 people, 10 people in the beginning? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's a process, that also, I mean, we didn't really show the very early concept process, but I would say that also is very iterative in nature. Um, you know, typically we start, it's very humble the way we start. It's not like somebody walks in and says, oh, I've got a vision. It's all here, let me show you. Right, usually you start and you say, how many square feet does the owner say it needs to be? And nobody's really exactly sure what the answer to this is, and, you know. And then somebody else, well, where is the site again? And how big is the site? And, right, everybody's sort of getting to feel, getting the feel of it, just like you do when you start probably kind of getting your head around all the requirements and all the parameters, right? And what is that building next door and how far away do we have to be from that building? Those kinds of really seemingly dumb questions. You're just getting a sense of what this project is, what all the parameters are that you're working with. And that takes a little bit of time, right? 
And usually we start off with a small team, maybe three people, and everybody sort of takes a shot at it. And you might have a pinup after four hours. And you say, OK, what ideas and what are you thinking about? And then you do that again. And you do it just to do that. You do that for five days. You've already got a lot of ideas drawn and some initial concept. And usually what happens from that process is some ideas start to emerge. Maybe there's some things in common and some things that you discard. And you distill it into maybe there's a few key ideas and you move forward with a few key options, right? And then you go through that process, so you keep going through that process. And we, we sort of picked this up. It's a good question, because we sort of picked up on this story a little, later, a little yeah. bit after that initial concept occurred. Yeah. There's a certain base level of experience among everybody on the team. And one of our colleagues has a great uh, way of phrasing this. He says, um, architects start out by drawing little pictures of big things. And we end by drawing big pictures of little things. So if you think about it, if we start out with a sketch this big, and it's the whole building. And at the end, we end up with a sketch this big, and it's a full-scale detail. right? And so if you kind of understand, everybody gets to know the process. And you sort of know where you are in the process. And so you're able to understand, OK, at this part in the process, we don't have to worry about the elevator cabs or the exact like look and feel of the lobby. Yeah. We know there will be a lobby. That's enough for now. And then you move on with what are the big moves that you have to get down first. And then I think it's just, you know, like we were saying, it's a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of the team getting together and pinning up and saying, does it make sense? Do we want to connect, you know, the office lobby to the public space so that tenants could come down and use that? Does that make sense for the type of building? Do we want the uh, interiors of the lobby to be very visible. How does that relate in, to an urban scale? So it's probably it's very similar to questions that you guys are mm -hmm. constantly asking yourself in school. You know, I think those questions carry on through you know to a project level, um, and then you know you're eventually you're presenting to the client. The client has their opinion as well. So it's kind of that consensus of opinion. I think uh, one of the other differences between school and practice is that. Our descriptions of things tend to be much simpler, whereas yeah. Yeah, your professor will have like another way of describing what you've done. We'll put, we'll have a pen up, and we'll say, "That looks cool." Yeah. Right? I like that, and if it resonates with everybody, you know you've got something, yeah. right? So it's much simpler. That's true. <laughs> but no less rigorous. <laughs> Maybe you guys could try that. I don't know. Next pen up. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, I had a. Slightly simple question, but the um, the skin, how did that really arrive? What sort of process did it take to rise uh, uh, to this level of, of shingling the glass panels? And then the second part to that question is how you resolved the corner condition. I don't think I saw. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about that. How that was resolved. Good, good question. It's a really good question. Um, did somebody prime you with that question? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is the group question. We should start by giving full credit to Tom Pfeiffer, as we did at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, this is a you know design partnership with Tom Pfeiffer, so he's an architect in New York. Um, he had actually done a shingled facade like this on a building in DC. So that concept was something that he brought to the table from the very beginning. Um, so we can't take credit for the initial concept, although we certainly contributed a lot, as you can tell, to the execution of it. Um, so that came forward from Tom. And then uh, the corner, although we didn't show the corner, um, I guess we have to show it to explain it. Yeah, question in the we back. We got a microphone if you want to. Um, thank you, first of all, for the good lecture and emphasizing such details, which usually lectures are not brought up. You know, and you you bring it to us. Thank you for this one. And my question is about how you come. You, I can understand that you probably being uh, go back and forth with your client and with the city and like all so many um, other parts of uh, design uh, teams influenced you, and um, for how you balance the decision between like your own team and um, decisions from like needs. For example, you switch the core. For me, it's. Uh, for me, it's a little bit like uh, it's understandable that the most functional uh, 
um, version is just one just course through the whole thing, yep. but you 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 was be able to switch it on a certain level. Like, what what did it cost you? And like, was it really a discussion between you and the client, or like how this gets together? Thank you. Yeah. So I think the question to they, repeat. They they've got it because oh, she's yeah. mic. Okay. Yeah. So um, thank you for the mic. Yeah, Good I mean, question. the core, I don't know that I've worked on a building where the core transfers. I think it was one of those like crazy ideas in Midnight that we had that was like, you know what, we've got this really small high rise floor plate and it doesn't make sense to put a core smack in the middle and then you have these spaces that are only, you know, 20 feet deep. It's deep from the column to the wall here. It's not a very planable space. So we kind of said, well, what if we just try this? What if we try to transfer it and you know, what that means essentially is all the mechanical is transferring as well, which that can be on a building, you know, you want mechanical to stack all the way up. You want to just kind of, like we said, extrude everything. Um, so I think that really took client buy-in because also one of the floors is almost sacrificial because it, you know, the stair has to transfer as well. So a large part of the 16th floor is taken up by the course. So the client really had to buy into that. Looked, we looked at the cost, you know, with the contractor. Um, yeah, I don't know. If you have anything yeah, to add. I think it's. I mean, it's a great question. It's how do you sort of who ultimately makes the decision, yeah. right? And uh, I would say one of the things that's nice about working with a developer client like Tishman Spire is that they build buildings over and over. So they bring a very high level of expertise to the project as well. So you're evaluating these decisions together with them, and we're giving our input. One of the things about Gensler is we work with a lot of tenants as well, and so we have a sense of what kind of space a tenant will want to lease, so we can give them that advice in the process as well. Um, but they also have a pretty good idea about what a Tishman Spire building is going to be like and what they're comfortable putting on the market. If it's a speculative development, there's a big financial risk for them. So they have to be comfortable with that, right? And so all of those decisions are coming into the mix. Ultimately, it's the client's decision to make with all of the input of the architect and all the other sort of experts at the table. And I would say that on this project for a spec office building, something that was unique is that you know, we were able to look at um, the workforce is changing a little bit. You know, I think that you know, if you look at, we saw the layouts for a professional service versus a tech firm. Those, you know, those spaces are very different spaces. So we were able to look at, you know, just being on the West Coast and the type of environment that we exist in day to day. And, you know, we're kind of, we're kind of ahead of the market in many ways. So we were able to kind of plan with that in mind as well for building. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, I have a question about the swing core. Um, so, like, I'm just interested. Should have brought the transfer. Interested. I should have brought the plants to show you guys. Yeah. Um, because um, you do typical cores like go straight, straight up. And now I'm just picturing in my mind like how many times can I actually swing, and then and because when you swing one time is considered ten cantilever, and then it takes away the space, and then the fire escape, all the problems start emerging. Sure. I'm just wondering like what is the limitation of S so the structure yeah yeah like how does the structure transfer? yep so let's see we do have uh structurally so when you look at the the massing you've got the high rise sitting on top of the low rise so there is um there's a the tr the structure is all transferring at that location um to just to go from one massing to the other so you've got transfer girders on uh level 16 uh, that are, I think the biggest plate girder is, is like four feet. There's a four foot tall plate girder um, that's taking the transfer load. Um, so there's a number of conditions where we transfer the structure so that um, we do it in the low rise again so that you can open up um, the east side of the building. And then we did it at the lobby as well so that you didn't have any, we didn't have any columns um, kind of in the middle of the office lobby. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I thought you were done. Sorry. Uh, so what I was going to interject was the uh, the core itself is not the structure of the core is not transferring, right? Lindsay's describing all of the perimeter columns from the high rise as they hit the low rise, they have to transfer out. Then the core 
even if you have a standard building, usually from the low rise to the high rise, you'll drop off some element of the core, the low rise elevator stop, you can taper the structure, just like a tree gets smaller at the top, right? Same idea. Yeah. So what happens is structurally, the core is really just tapering and all of the fungible things like toilet rooms, mechanical shafts, things like that are able to then swing around to the other side of the core, but the structure stays the same. So, so it's not like in the, in the I thought it was like the structure swing and then structure. So no. no the, so the brace frames that you guys saw in the photos, those chase that, that, that part of the core, which is essentially a square that chases all the way up. So that's kind of the main primary um, for lateral. And then the yeah, the same, well, there's, yes, I'm sorry. It gets, yeah, so the high rise, the high rise goes all the way up, and then what happens is the low rise elevators, so it's a rectangle in the low rise. The low rise drops off and stops because those elevator stops, but then north of that, the structure keeps going. You it's can transfer a core when you're in school, but not after. So do it now, get it out of your system. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my my question was about the uh, mock-ups. Like, how do you guys decide um, who goes to those mock-ups? Because all of those, you guys, like all China, over. like different yeah. places around the world. So how do you guys decide uh. who goes? <laughs> and then whose budget and where does that come from? Yeah, great question. Um, the don't, don't you decide usually, Lindsay? And yeah. You tell me you get to go to Hong yeah. Kong? <laughs> I did not go to Hong Kong. <laughs> You tell me you have to go to Hong Kong. Yeah, that's like <laughs> think what happened. I was like, I got, I have something going on. You got to go to Hong Kong. <laughs> um, but that's how it gets decided. Yeah, <laughs> it pretty much. But for the like something as big as kind of the major mock-up, I would say is the performance mock-up, right? That's like the major where you see the two wall types and they do all the testing. So that one, um, you know, the client will be there. We have a facade consultant. Um, uh, couple of people from Gensler. So that one is usually more involved. And then, um, yeah, it's just kind of who's available and who's been working on what. And then that, the budget comes, you know, it's part of the proje project budget. You need the key decision makers at the mock-up because that's a decision point. And from there, there's not, you can't go back, right? Yeah. So you need to make sure that the key people are there who can make a decision and then move the project forward, give direction to the contractor, the supplier. So that's usually the architect and somebody from the owners yeah. is, is represented. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. <laughs>